questions that are asked about baptism and then also deal with communion as a doctrine in the Bible as well. Now, first let's take a look at the major doctrines that we've dealt with so far. There are seven, and we are in the midst of five of those. And the fifth one has been broken down into some subcategories, but you'll, as you see them, you'll remember. We have the inspiration of the Bible that's covered in basically 2 Timothy 3.16. There are other verses as well, but this is just a summary, so I'm not going to read through those right now. The second major doctrine uh, in helping us to understand our faith is the divinity of Jesus Christ. Not all believe that Jesus is divine, that he is di divinity, that he is God. And John 1 and 1 talks about that uh, through verse number 14. Then we have the goodness of man. That in Genesis 1, 31, at the beginning, before sin came in the world, God made man upright. Did he not? He made, he made him, matter of fact, when at, in the beginning of God's creation, at the end of the, those days, what he said every time was, it was good, okay? And so there was a period of time when man was good, all right, and not fallen from his sin. And then that's our next fourth, the fourth doctrine was the fall of man through sin. Romans 3.23 substantiates that as well. And the one major doctrine that's really full of a lot of information is the reconciliation of man to God. God made man upright, and he was good. Man fell because of his sin and disobedience to God. And then now God goes into reconciling man back to God. We had a relationship with God where we walked with him in the coolness of the day, in the garden of Eden, right? That had to go away because of sin. And that was for our benefit, not because God was an angry God, but it was to man's benefit that that relationship would have to be reformed, reshaped. Because if we would have continued to exist it under the current circumstances, we would not have had a way to commune with God eternally. That's right. Okay? So God worked to reconcile man back to him. Now that reconciliation has a lot of different sub doctrines, okay? I'm going to go to this other one because my notes are on this one. Alright? And those sub doctrines have our ten sub doctrines. Five that actually are the plan of salvation and five that gives us a view of that salvation. And those five that are the actual plan of salvation, this is what God did. He planned it and achieved it to bring about our salvation. Alright? And that is election. And, who, and, and that election is not an individual thing except for the fact that God or Jesus was the one that God elected right. to save mankind. So there was somebody needed to achieve this reconciliation. So what God did uh, at the beginning of time is when he chose one person to do that. Who was that one person? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So Jesus right. was elected to reconcile man back to God. The second a plan, God's plan of salvation was predestination. He predestined how Jesus was going to do that. Jesus was elected, and the, the mode, the means, the operation that that reconciliation would happen was chosen before the beginning of the world. God predestined Jesus to do it, and the manner in which that was going to be done. Okay? Then there was the atonement. We see that predestination unfold. All right? The plan unfolded, and part of that is Jesus was elected, the plan was predestined, all right, and before Jesus came in the world, so Jesus, God was getting things ready through the prophets, through Moses, through the children of Israel, through the Old Testament. All that was predestined. That's right. Okay? And, and then when Jesus came, he atoned for our sins. How did that atonement happen? On the cross. On the when cross. Jesus died, he died for our sins. That death atoned us for our sin. Okay? Now, it didn't atone us without our participation. Right. All right? God is not a stalker. God is, isn't going to make you love him like so many boyfriends try to do with girlfriends today. I'm going to make you love me. And then they follow them everywhere and, and then you wind up having to get a restraining order because that's not love, is it? Yeah, no, All right? That, that's a stalker. That's something crazy about that. God is not a stalker. So for us to participate in that atonement, we have to uh, choose that sacrifice, right? We have to make the choice because love is not love without a choice. That's right. Amen. And 
so that's the third of the five sub-doctrines for reconciliation, which is God's plan to save us, to reconcile us back to himself. And then we are redeemed. That's the fourth of the five plan of salvation. And in that redemption, we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Okay? It was the blood of the Lamb that was shed that allowed us to have our sins forgiven. So we have been redeemed. And that blood, what that blood did was allow Jesus to purchase us back from sin, right? Because that sin was forgiven, and that blood, life is in the blood. There's a whole bunch of things that we could talk about where that is concerned. So we have Jesus was elected, plan was predestined, the atonement happened, then we were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and, and then the last part of reconciliation is not to allow us to continue in our state of sin without hope. So now we're being regenerated, we're being renewed, we're being sanctified. And that's what regeneration is. That's what John 3 and 3 through 5 is as well. So that's God's plan. So that's what's going on with us right now. We're being regenerated as Amen. we're being sanctified. Okay, we're being made into the image of Christ. All right, and, and hopefully you are seeing that happen more effectively with more resolve uh, as you live. All right? continue to be regenerated. Now, those doctrines come with benefits. Those sub five sub-doctrines, they come with benefits, and the Bible describes them from different views, those benefits, all right? And those five are, and we're in the midst of the fifth one right now, but adoption is one view. That's it from a human perspective. From the human perspective, we have been adopted as the sons of God. Right. Okay. So for us to understand our reconciliation, all right, the, the Bible gives us a human perspective, a human view of our salvation, which is our adoption as sons. All right. Another view we get is called justification. All right. This is one of the ten smaller sub doctrines. The first five are the actual plan of salvation. The second five, which we're looking at now, these are the different benefits and the views of that salvation, all right? And justification is a legal view, all right? So from a legal standpoint, we look at our our, uh, our salvation as we have been justified. Tony, what do you always say? Just as if I <laughs> didn't, do it. didn't do it, all right? We have been justified as, as if we have never been sinned, and we've been justified in Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 3 through 4 looks at that. So we have a human view that's adoption. We have a legal view. That's justification. And then we have perfection. Now, that's from a human view. So this is what God sees going on in us. God sees us being perfected. Not that we're perfect, but we're being perfected, which is a part of our regeneration. Did you look at that understanding, right? So by the Holy Spirit, and by his word, and now that we have been justified, we're being perfected, shaped and molded in the image of Son. Uh, of, of his son Jesus Christ so the view that perfection's view is from a heavenly perspective that's what they see going on all right if I understand that so far I know I'm talking fast and then fourth is our sanctification that's an inward view all right that's that's the view that we should be that the inner man should be having about what's going on in this salvation and what it is is that we're being set apart Okay, we're being sanctified. We're being set aside for noble purposes, the way that the Bible describes it, all right? And so sanctification doesn't mean that you roll down the aisle and shout uncontrollably. Sanctification means that you're being set apart for a purpose. There are some things in your kitchen, ladies, that is set apart for a special purpose, right? And, and maybe you even might have some dishes that are sanctified. They only come out. They're not everyday dishes. They're not everyday dishes. They come out on a special occasion, right? They are sanctified. Okay, they're set apart for a purpose. And we are being sanctified as well, set apart for God's noble purposes. And then there's the salvation view. The salvation view is an eschatological view. Eschatological means uh, the end times. It's from the end times perspective. All right, that all these things that God has done has resulted, we may not even be there yet, but if you view it from the end and look throughout the whole thing, we have been saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so those are all the doctrines real quick. That was pretty good. I should have timed myself. 
<laughs> so what we want to talk about tonight is basically these questions that always come up about baptism. Now, the older I get, I really don't even understand why there are questions about baptism. Because even when popular apologists today who make money from having websites and the like, they're trying to get the largest audiences they can, they won't come out and directly say that baptism is necessary for salvation. They'll go through this long diatribe of why you really don't have to be baptized. But then before they conclude, they say, but I don't see any reason why a Christian wouldn't be baptized. Because to be baptized is to obey God. Now, that just refuted everything you could. You could have, you could have started with that and kept all that other nonsense. Right. If, if that's obeying God, that's obeying God. Is obeying God necessary? Yes, it is. I would think so. All right? But that doesn't get you clicks. It doesn't get you views. It doesn't get you an audience. And so sometimes these apologists choose the hill that they're going to die on. Okay? And they choose not to die on the baptismal hill. They'll die on the abortion hill. They'll, they'll die on the, you know, love, love one another hill, but they won't die on the baptism hill for some reason because it has some denominational dilemmas that come with it. All right? And so we're gonna we're gonna just we're gonna just start dealing with that, all right? Now baptism, we need to understand this. Just like the cross was the moment in time when atonement was made available to man, mm -hmm. baptism is the historical moment in time when the benefits of our salvation come into operation. You get that? It's not when you pray to God, all right? It's not when you ask God to come into your heart. It's not when you do a whole myriad of other things that the world has determined is salvation. It's when you're baptized. Amen. When you're baptized, that's the, the line in the sand that you can draw in the history of time that when your salvation came into effect. Does that make sense? All right? And every time baptism is mentioned in the New Testament, all right, it is mentioned or it is done so in connection with salvation. Every single time. And we have 10 instances in the book of Acts alone that, that talk about that. All right? And so baptism and salvation are very easily connected one to the other, right? We also see that in Galatians 9, Galatians 3 and 27, there are terms that are used that actually mean baptism, all right? So the, the, what the Bible will say is in, in Galatians 3 and 27, you are clothed with Christ. What is Paul referring to? He's referring to your baptism, okay? So clothed with Christ is equivalent to being baptized. Everybody understand that? Same thing in Acts 22 and 6. 16. When talking about washing away your sins, when Paul recounted his story and he was told to get up and wash away your sins, what, what was he being told? He was told to be baptized. Okay? So yes, the Bible uses different terms, and that's what these apologists who use a lot of words to explain very simple things, they'll turn to terms like these, but these terms are referring to getting baptized. All right? And so where salvation and baptism are concerned, they are always linked together. Now, with, those, with, those, with that very quick understanding, let's look at some of the questions about baptism. All right? And if we have time, we'll also get to uh, communion as well. Now, is baptism necessary for salvation? Now, you know what this preacher is going to say, but we like to have simple answers, so I'm going to give you one. Yes. <laughs> Okay, the answer is yes. Only saved people can claim to be obedient to the gospel. Doesn't that make sense? Is being baptized being obedient to God? Yes, it is. Yes. All right. Only saved people can claim to be disciples. Only saved people can say that they are forgiven. Only saved people can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Only saved people can be members of the one body. That is Christ Jesus. Amen? And the Bible is very clear. That's what baptism does. Yes. It makes one a disciple. It makes one. Baptism is the forgiveness of sins. It, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2. Amen? Amen? And you become members of one body. Only say people can make that claim. And only people that can make that claim are people who have been baptized. Does that make sense? Only say people can claim to have these things, and these things are given and come into effect at 
baptism. Previously, 10 scriptural references were listed in order to prove this point. You should have had some of those in part number one. All right? So is baptism necessary for salvation? We don't be, need to be mean with this, and I think that's been our problem over the years. We don't need to be haughty about this and prideful about it. I think that's been part of the issue as well. But one needs to be baptized if he's going to be saved. That's true. Jesus was baptized. To me, that ends all arguments. And what did Jesus say? Suffer it to be so. Why? Because this fulfills all righteousness. And if Jesus is our example, who who would say that Jesus isn't our example? He is our example, right? In all things. all. So if our example was baptized, wouldn't that kind of end the argument? Mm -hmm. sure. Sure. And I should be baptized as well. All right. Let, let's lay down the rest. I know people still have questions about it, and just like I was saying this morning, the world doesn't accept these things. I understand that. But I'm giving you honest evidence on why this is true. And, and, I, and I'm trying to encourage you to, to stand in that truth. Don't back off of it. Because the world has become so aggressive with Christians that, that we have determined that, oh, maybe we should back off some of these things. No, we need to stand firm on these things. Okay? So in trying to refute this idea of being baptized, well, doesn't the Bible say that we're saved by faith? Okay? Isn't faith what you, you're supposed to have? Now, to me, there's a couple of problems with this. Number one, I think people believe that faith is just simple believing. That's right. right. That's right. You just believe something, so you have faith. No, faith is not about a mental assent. It doesn't mean that you agree with somebody, so you, now you have faith. And you guys know the example I use. I continue using it because it makes the best of sense. I had faith that on my job, they were going to pay me. Now, I couldn't stay home with that faith, could I? No, sir. Would I have gotten paid? No. no. What do I got? I got to go to work, right? Yeah, that's right. Faith means you do something. That's right. All right? Faith is not just hope in the sky and, and, and believing on a whim. Hope is backed up by honest evidence. Again, using that term, all right? And so because I believe... They were going to pay me. I went to work. That's right. Amen. And after a while, I started recognizing, hey, Brother Nancy, I'm going to get to retire. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm really going to work now. <laughs> I'm going to work a little overtime. And maybe my reward in retirement will be better. So my faith increased. Mm -hmm. Right? I got to the point where I didn't want to miss work. Because I didn't want my 26 years to have to be 27 or 28 or whatever the case may You guys understand what I'm covering, bro? Yeah. Our faith should work that same way, all right? So we are saved by faith. Yes, faith. we are saved by faith. But when it, when it teaches this is always in response to those who are trying to be saved by some system of the law. So when you have this teaching in the Bible about faith, in the New Testament, I'm speaking of, what, what the apostles and Paul are trying to refute is some system that Judaizers and Pharisees and Sadducees and those that opposed Paul and opposed Jesus were trying to insinuate or trying to bring back the law in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so they were refuting, fighting them, trying to bring the law back by, by teaching you saved by faith. But they never backed off of baptism. Okay, you still had to do that, all right? But what the reason that, that faith teaching is confusing a lot of people is the context in which the faith teaching comes out and where faith and salvation are connected. Do you guys understand that? So they were trying to say that we're saved by works, and they tried to bring works in to try to save us, like circumcision. And then Paul and the apostles pushed back against that. No, circumcision doesn't save. You are saved by faith. Because they, they understood what faith was. Faith wasn't just believing to them. Faith, faith was doing what God told you to do. That's right. right. Amen. So when they were arguing it, that's what they were arguing, right? So salvation has always been about faith also. Because we might go back to the Old Testament, and that's what some do. The Catholic faith does that a lot. They're going back towards, going back to the Old Testament for a lot of their doctrines, all right? And, and a lot of their doctrines are, are doctrines of work, yes. all right, for salvation. But... Even in the Old Testament, you were saved by faith, not by works. No one is saved by works, right? Abraham himself, the father of the faithful, right? He, and he was the father of the faith. Why? Because he 
He believed God. That's faith. He believed God, and it was credited to him as faith. Now, when a when God called uh, Abram in the earth of the Chaldeans and told him to get up and leave your father, your father's land, your father's people, and go to a place that I will show you, and, and he didn't sit there and just lay in his bed and say, okay, God, I got you, I believe you. I have faith. faith. <laughs> He got up That's right. and left his. And we have no appreciation for just how difficult that actually would have been mm. to get up and leave his family, That's right. which which was his sustenance. That's how he was supported mm. under that patriarchal system. The the, the the patriarch of that family provided for everybody in that caravan. That's right. That, that's why the oldest son always got the the bior. It's called in the Hebrew. That's why the, the oldest son always got a double portion of the inheritance. Because not only what, what, did he succeed his father, but he took on his father's responsibility. What was his father responsible for? The whole plan, everybody. So he got a double portion. And some say that's why Esau didn't take his birthright seriously. Because he didn't want the responsibility. He's, you know, that's why he said, well, what is my inheritance to me if I'm dying? You know, just feed me. So he didn't take it responsibly. And that Jacob. Jacob wanted that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, we're saved by faith, but the context there does not do away with baptism. All it is is doing is refuting the idea that we're saved by works. Okay, then some people bring up Romans ten verses ten through thirteen. It's the third question. But there, the Bible says, "For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is and is saved." Once again, we're trying to slide in the door of faith alone. Okay? Verse 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in me will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. Restoring his riches are all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. First of all, we have to understand what there's a lot in here. I'm going to break this down the way I want to break it down. So, when, when in verse 13 when it says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved that that's worship to call on the name of the Lord is to worship God so whenever you see call on the name of the Lord you can replace that with or say that it's equivalent to worshiping God all right now if we go back to the earlier verse in verse 11 it said for the scripture says everyone who believes in him I always like to shut this down because I think it just is the argument is does Satan believe in Jesus? Yes, he does. Yes. Will he be put to shame? Yes, he will. So obviously his belief alone, it's not enough. which is, which is that's being added here. I want you to see that as well. You don't see alone in this passage at all, do you? That's because when, when they're describing believing, when Paul is describing believing here, he's, the, he's describing it with the understanding that you believe acts on what's commanded. But you're not saved by the work, you're saved by the act of faith, right? And so everyone who believes is not true. There'll be people in hell who believe in Jesus. Yes. Absolutely there will. Why? Because they, they work against Jesus. They don't obey him. Can you believe in something and not follow it? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay? I believe there's evil people in the world doing evil things. And, I, and I'm not following it. <laughs> okay? So it is possible to believe something and not follow it. Our belief follows. It complies. It submits. It obeys. Right? So what the world and, and all and this is all this all this is is a debate tactic. It is not a serious death nail to baptism. Mm -hmm. It's just how people try to put you in your place by saying, well, baptism is a work. No, it's not a work. Yeah, you know, I, I, I did this once in a sermon where I talked about tr what true work, true works come from you. They, they originate from you. So if you want something, you determine how much work you're going to do to get what it is that you want. So I set the standard. I've set the goal. I didn't set the standard of baptism. No, you did not. I didn't set the standard of the goal of baptism. So it doesn't it originate with me. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't come from Barry. It comes from God. So it's not a work when I obey it. It's an act of faith. Yeah. You understand that difference? So everyone who believes, Romans 10, 13, once again, does not apply. And our, our author said that he could do the same trick with any verse in the Bible. The 
if you look at Luke 24 and verses 46 through 47, and said to them, and this is Jesus talking, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. All right? Now, if this were the only passage I use, I could say that repentance was the point of salvation. That's right. Not faith or baptism. You have to see the passage in context, Romans 10, 10 through 13, and what that context means, right? And I won't take time to, we, we could break down the whole book of Romans and see that the way that our evangelical friends try to make Romans 10 and 10 through 13 mean does not fit in the context of that book. All right? So let me put that on the bed for number four. Should I be rebaptized? Get this question a lot as well. Well, I believe that baptism is an answer to God. It's a good conscience as an answer to God. Right? So I'm not going to wrestle with you a lot if you come up to me and say, well, Brother Johnson, I think I need to be rebaptized. I'm going to question you, but I want you to have a good conscience towards God. Okay? I've rebaptized some people before. One was Dual Gant Jr. His father was a preacher. Dual Gant Sr. And Dual Gant Jr. got to a point much later on in his year, just before you guys came to Maywood, where he thought, you know, that maybe he should be baptized again. I mean, maybe I got baptized just to please my father. Okay? So we dealt with that question a couple times, and he remained resolute in that, so we'll go ahead and get rebaptized, right? So many ask this question because they're not sure how to resolve the issue. In Acts 19, we have good information to help us decide this issue. In Acts 19, Paul rebaptized 10 men who had been baptized in the proper way, that's through immersion, but for the wrong reason. John's baptism. That's right. You all remember that? Yeah. All right. John's baptism of repentance and preparation was for the coming of Christ. He explained salvation to them in terms of the Holy Spirit. We hear about that in Acts 2.38. And rebaptized them so that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism never promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism never promised that one would be a disciple of Christ. John's baptism never promised that you would be added to the body of Christ. Nor could it, because Christ had died on that cross yet. We just use common sense, all right? So he explained that to them. And once he explained it to them, then he baptized them. He really, re he really didn't re-baptize them. He baptized them for the first time. Yeah, true. Now, Paul could have explained salvation using any number of images, sonship, clean conscience, clothed with Christ. But he did not. He chose only one image of salvation and baptized them. The forgiveness and the reception of the Holy Spirit that we continually repeat to the world and should always do it until the world comes to an end. Yeah. That's all Paul did. And he baptized it. I know the world doesn't want to hear that. We have to preach it. Anymore. I know the world rejects that. That doesn't mean we are to reject it as well. So here are some questions that come to try to help people decide should they be rebaptized. I really only have two. One is, or one is you should ask, was I baptized in the right way? you were sprinkled, I would ask for your, your biblical example of sprinkling. There is none. So then you weren't baptized in the right way. Should you be baptized in the right way? Yes. Okay. By immersion in water as a repentant believer in Christ. That's what, you, that's what needs to happen. That's why you cannot baptize babies. That's right. What are they repenting of? They can't repent. They're not even choosing to be baptized. They're Their parents are doing that. Okay. If you are not sure that you have done this, if you have been sprinkled or poured, then you need to consider being baptized correctly by immersion. Okay? The second question you should ask is, was I baptized for the right reason? The first one is the right way. The second one is the right reason. The reason for baptism is simply salvation, to be saved. It's not to become a member of some, con some denomination. That's not a reason. It's for salvation. That salvation could have been explained to you in various ways. It could have been explained to you that you're obeying the gospel, Mark 16. That you're being baptized to become a disciple, Matthew 28. That you're being baptized to be born again, John 3. That you're being baptized to receive the forgiveness of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. When you're given biblical reasons for your baptism, you're being baptized for the right reasons. 
There are other biblical reasons, but these should suffice for the sake of argument. When you are baptized for one of these ideas that connect you to salvation, that you have, you have been then baptized the correct way. So if you have a biblical reason plus a biblical method, then that equals a biblical salvation. Is that all right? Biblical reason plus biblical method equals biblical salvation. And there's only one biblical method in the Bible. And that's immersion in water. You know, actually today in Christian scholarly theology, there is no more debate about baptism. There really isn't. Okay? People have pretty much have, uh, even those opposed to being baptized for salvation, that baptism is immersion in water. It's even taught that way in, in seminaries and colleges all across this land. So, so what do we do? So what does the world do to keep baptism from happening? They say, you, you don't need to do it. This is what it is, but you don't need to do it. Okay? Just have, make sure your heart is right before God. Right. All right, real quickly, that's baptism. Hopefully, we've said enough to confront you in your beliefs about baptism and giving you honest evidence about the truth of God's word that baptism is necessary for you to be a disciple, for you to receive the Holy Spirit, for you to have your sins forgiven, for you to be added to the one body of Christ. And from that, you can assume very easily that baptism is necessary for salvation. I think sometimes we leave with that part and we don't explain the rest, right? We need to, to bring that in. So the last major doctrine, real quick, is communion. Now communion, uh, and, and Walter said it very well this morning too, all right? I'm not always a fan of using the word symbols, but for, the, for us in understanding what communion is, these, the symbols that happen in the Lord's table remind us of the plan of salvation. Yes, it does. Okay? The symbols remind us that the choice of Christ, the perfect sacrifice, death as a penalty to bring freedom and life, communion displays that for us. This is where our minds should go on the first day of the week when we're doing that. Secondly, the common action of eating and drinking reminds us of those benefits. Innocent, acceptable children, holy before God, eating and drinking with each other. This is why communion is taken after baptism and not before. And then the repetition on the Lord's Day is a reminder to us and to the world that God's plan will one day be completed when the Lord comes again. Once again, let's try to summarize what we have learned so far in a single thought. Through baptism and communion, God's plan of salvation and man's faith come together in a concrete physical form that blesses man and honors God. Wouldn't we all want to do that? Amen. If you're here tonight, you have heard God's plan of salvation. We allow, we invite, we conjole that you accept this invitation. You can accept that invitation because you have heard the word of Christ. Now it's up to you to believe it. Not mentally ascend to it. You can mentally agree that what I have said is in the Bible, but are you prepared to do what's in the Bible? That's belief. It's faith in action. Amen. You repent of your sins. Because unless we repent, unless we change from our worldly way and, and our, our obstinance to God's command, we'll, we'll be lost forever. That's what Jesus was trying to warn in Luke 13 and 3. Unless we repent, we will all likewise perish. We must confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is God's Son. A confession that everyone's going to make anyway. That's right. Then we have to be baptized, immersed, so that we can be added to the body of Christ. Have our sins forgiven. Become a disciple. Receive the Holy Spirit. Become a member of the one body. All that happens when we are baptized. Mm -hmm. And then once you've done that, to remain faithful. Not to draw back, but to stand firm. Amen. Find the truth and stand in it. Remain resolved all the days of your life, and you will receive the crown of life. Amen. If you're subject to that invitation at home, let us be subject to that invitation here today. Let us know as well as we turn the service back over to Brother Jerry. Thank you, Brother Barry.